As opposition mounts to a draft Brexit deal hammered out last week, Ireland's foreign minister is standing firm, saying there is no room for maneuvering within the withdrawal agreement. His comments came in an exclusive interview with Euronews. And for more on that, I am joined by our correspondent Shona, Shona Murray, who is in Dublin for us. Shona, can you tell us about uh, your interview with the foreign minister today? Well, as you can imagine, Tessa, things are quite guarded here. There's also a mood of anticipation because we know that Ireland has been at the epicentre of these Brexit talks. For two years almost, the negotiations have been taking place and Ireland has huge stakes in this game. So the foreign minister I spoke to today said several things. First of all, he was quite critical of some of the tone of the Brexiteers and their simplistic language, as he put it, in relation to how easy this deal could be produced. Um, He's also saying that he would love if the UK would remain in the European Union, but he wasn't calling for a second referendum. He said it was very clear that Theresa May said she doesn't want to extend Article 50. But I also asked him if there was any room to manoeuvre, because we've heard from MPs on both sides of the divide, Remains, Tories, Labourers, Brexiteers, that they, could, they claimed that they could actually change this withdrawal agreement. He said, absolutely, 100%. The deal is as it stays and it won't be reopened. Have it, take a listen to what he said. The withdrawal treaty text is agreed. It's closed. The British government signed off on it. It's not going to reopen. Uh, if you reopen it for one issue, well then there's an avalanche of, of other asks, I'm sure, that different countries will have. Um, so no, that text is closed. Uh, and, and let's hope uh, that we can see a positive text now on what the future relationship uh, is, uh, is likely to look like by the, the setting of parameters today uh, in that political declaration. Will the EU welcome the UK back with open arms and possibly extend Article 50? Theresa May has made it very clear she doesn't want to extend Article 50. Um, so I think we, we probably need to talk less about the what-ifs here and talk more about what is actually on the table and agreed. But the EU would welcome the UK back? Oh, sure, of course we would. You know, I mean... We'd, we'd, we'd welcome Britain back in a heartbeat, uh, uh, in my view. Nobody wants Britain to leave. Uh, everybody, in fact, you know, so many EU countries look to Britain for direction. The EU without Britain, for me, is a lesser place. Um, uh, and uh, I would certainly, at any point in the future, uh, would love to see Britain um, rejoining or being part of the European Union. But look, that is, you know, that's talking about the future in a way that doesn't reflect today's reality. Sometimes when I listen to hardline Brexiteers, they simplify Brexit into almost into a, 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 you know, a totally unreal uh, series of choices where Britain can have it every which way uh, and where the EU will just have to suck it up. You know, and that, that kind of simplistic, in some, in some cases macho language, doesn't, uh, doesn't reflect reality. You know, it is not in Britain's interest to crash out of the European Union with no agreements in a whole series of different areas uh, when Britain and the EU together over the last 43 or 44 years have been putting hundreds of different mechanisms and agreements in place that can't just be pulled apart overnight. What would you say to the Remainers and Brexiteers, many of whom are willing to vote against this deal when they get the chance in December? What next if that fails. I am hopeful that the British Parliament can support this. Uh, as the debate develops, uh, as the Prime Minister sells this deal, uh, I think she's very persuasive uh, and I think she has right on her side uh, in terms of what's in the deal. Uh, and, um, and I think uh, her arguments have gathered momentum in the last number of days. Let's wait and see how, how this develops. There's another three weeks to go probably before the vote takes place in Westminster. Uh, and instead of talking about what happens after that vote, should it not pass, uh, I think we should be concentrating for the next three weeks on actually talking about what's in the agreement that's taken two years to put together uh, and to try to reassure people that it's not a threat to anybody. Uh, instead, it's a practical series of compromises that allows both sides to move forward together. Now, we know that, of course, the, um, the, the odds are stacked against Theresa May when it comes to this parliamentary vote um, in December. And the Irish government is very realistic about that, naturally. 
but it does hope that within the next few days, particularly upon the publication of the political declaration of the future agreement, there'll be enough to placate some in the Tory party and enough on the Remain side that this isn't such a bad deal for the UK and that in the future, you know, they can have that frictionless trade and they can maintain the territorial integrity of the United Kingdom and even possibly to placate the DUP. It's, it's a really tall charge, it's a tall order, but there is hope that that can happen. Just one other thing I did speak to the Foreign Minister about earlier. He is pretty self-assured that this extraordinary council meeting will go ahead on Sunday and there will be a formalisation of the withdrawal agreement. There is a belief that the concerns about Gibraltar, the future of Gibraltar, the Spanish concerns and of course the French and other countries' concerns related to level playing field, that that can also be dealt with and in actual fact people can move on in unison. It's December really where they're looking at. Right, thank you for that. Uh, Shona Murray talking to us there from Dublin. And with me in the studio to discuss this in more detail, we still have Christine Bonfa. And also joining us is, is back is our political editor, Darren McCaffrey, and Martina Anderson, who is an Irish uh, Sinn Féin MEP with the U European United Left Nordic Green Left Group. Right, I'll, I'll start with you, Martina, because we had heard rumours and murmurs that the DUP would be uh, planning to vote down uh, this deal in, in the House of Commons. What is uh, Sinn Féin's position when it comes to the draft deal? Well, in the first instance, we welcome the fact that there's going to be no physical infrastructure on, on the island of Ireland, on the, on the border, partitioning Ireland. But Sinn Féin produced a case for designated special status for the North to remain within the EU. And that case was legally tested in that we had legal advice to show that that was legally possible and permissible. And we cannot have a situation where 50 years on from the civil rights campaign and 20 years on from the Good Friday Agreement, that hard-won rights are so going to be stripped away. So, do, was so it, how would, how would uh, so you're, when it comes to the draft deal, what, what do you think about that? Is it, a, is it a go? Well, I think the draft deal avoids a physical infrastructure okay. on the island of Ireland. But what it doesn't do is protect people. It protects cattle. It protects white goods, it protects a wash machine and a tumble dryer, but it doesn't ahead. protect people. Oh. And that's what I am well, extremely well, concerned people about. People born in Northern Ireland will still be able to be Irish, uh, be sorry, European citizens. Well, um, through I'm the Irish citizenship. Well, I'm assuming you have read the agreement and read the, the whole 600 pages, because yeah, I've been through it. Yeah. So, let, so let me say. In December, we were told yeah. that people born on the island of Ireland and people born on the north of Ireland would be able to enjoy and access, right. uh, access and exercise our rights where we reside. That language is removed from the agreement. So you are out of step no, with on. human rights and the, the entire but human rights not, equality but that's not, but that's not right in, in the, the north. That that you can avail of your Irish... If you're born Christine. in Northern Ireland, you can avail of right. your Irish citizenship. Well, well, let me just make sure I just, 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 just okay. answer that one. I'm assuming you also read the answer that I received from President Juncker in July when he said that we in the north of Ireland will be merely able to exercise our rights right. as we were third world, uh, a third world Christine, country. Christine, would you jump, so jump into this? So it's not true what you're saying. To the Irish question. Yeah. Uh, for, for, for us, I mean the Socialist and Democrats group, we were very concerned by the fact that we shouldn't come back to a very back history where Northern, Northern Ireland and Republic of Ireland were completely with this border. It's not, it was not bearable and we were very cautious on this, on the agreement, and this is why we are looking at it. And just like you said, and just like I said before, the question of the single market, the question of economics is really dealt in this agreement, but the question of people, so you're not happy of humanity, with it. the three million living in, uh, in the United Kingdom, or the question of Ireland has to be really carefully read. So you but, think it's not complete yet? I haven't read all the 300 pages, so I won't say more than this, that we are very cautious and we are are looking at it very carefully about this situation of people, not the goods, the people. I mean, I think it's safe to say that even with the draft deal, the, the question of the Irish border and the details of it is not uh, complete, has not been completely put to rest.